Jefferson Literary and Debating Society, now in its 187th year of perpetual existence. Please both please stand proud to present the eighth speaker in its weekly speaker series for the spring semester of 2012, Dr. Robert Reiser. Dr. Reiser will present a speech entitled From Homer to the Hospital, telling the stories of the emergency department. Dr. Reiser is Associate Professor of Clinical Emergency Medicine and Medical Director for the Spire Program at the Emergency Department at the University of Virginia. He received his BS in Biology, his MS in Physiology and Biophysics, and his MD from Georgetown University. He has had extensive medical experience with appointments in teaching positions such as clinical instructor at the University of Connecticut, visiting lecturer at the King Faisal Royal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and the medical director of fire departments in both Hampton and New Haven, C. Connecticut, as assistant professor in the surgery department at the Yale School of Medicine, and as the two-time head physician at the U.S. Senior National Judo Championships, among many more. <laughs> More recently at our own university, Dr. Reiser has served as liaison to hospital risk management, liaison to patient representatives, associate director for clinical operations at the emergency department, service center medical director at the emergency department, assistant professor of clinical emergency medicine, and associate professor. He is a member of the AOA Medical Honor Society, American College of Emergency Physicians, Virginia College of Emergency Physicians, and Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. And he has listed his personal interests as muscle cars, motorcycles, and yacht design. Jefferson Society is indeed honored to host such a distinguished individual this evening. Please stand and join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Reiser. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a delight to be back among you. I'm here in the fall for the bioethics debate, uh, and I really enjoy uh, our association. Uh, this is one of my favorite things about UVA, uh, the, the traditions and the history. Um, I'm really honored to be a small part of the history of your society. Uh, this uninterrupted uh, oratory tradition that you guys have is something that we're going to cover tonight a little bit uh, in this talk, an even longer oral tradition. Uh, you guys, it'll give you something to shoot for, I think, uh, as you go forward. Uh, we will include some literary uh, pieces as well, uh, and I think this is a perfect uh, setting, the Literary and Debating Society, because the merits of my literary efforts uh, might be called uh, debatable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that uh, toward the end of the talk. Uh, someone uh, keep me on time here. In medical school, we give 50-minute talks, and I'm sort of biologically programmed uh, around 50-minute intervals. So if I start to go over, which seems unlikely, uh, Cut me off. Uh, when I started uh, writing for the Crozet Gazette, uh, and my editor's back there, uh, some 60 columns ago, six years ago, I uh, started writing a medical column, and I had two models uh, of medical writers that I wanted to emulate science writers. One was Lewis Thomas, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, The Lies of the Cell. He is a doctor and a biologist. Uh, but I quickly realized 30 years out of college uh, that biology had moved on, and I had to uh, so I had another model that I could use, uh, and that was a guy by the name of Stephen J. Gould. Stephen J. Gould uh, was a paleontologist at Harvard, and he wrote a, week, a monthly column uh, for the magazine Natural History. Uh, and I loved his column because he did something really neat. He always had a hook. So he'd start off with something familiar. Uh, he was a big baseball fan, so he'd talk about Ted Williams, the last 400 hitter uh, in the major leagues. And then he'd relate it to something unfamiliar. There you go. Uh, nobody else knows. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and so the question is, why are there no more 400 hitters uh, in Major League Baseball? Some of it has to do with the pitching, probably. Uh, but mostly, as he explained it, it had to do with a complex statistical uh, model called regression to the norm. So I really liked the way he would use a hook, is what he called it, to take something that he could explain and then explain a complicated topic. And that's what I've tried to do in my medical writing. Uh, and really, uh, it's, it's kind of a metaphor, uh, Greek word metaphor means to transfer something over, to carry it over from the familiar uh, to the strange, and to bring the strange back over to the familiar. So this talk is going to have a hook. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something that's probably somewhat familiar uh, to some of you, most of you, at least have a passing familiarity with the works of Homer. Uh, and then we're going to relate that, I'm going to relate that to how doctors uh, transmit oral information uh, in a very similar fashion. Uh, so 
that's what we're going to talk about. Before I start, uh, I, I went to dinner with a number of the, the members of the society, and I was thrilled, or really chilled, to learn that at least one classic major exists among us. Uh, so here I am talking about Homer to a room full of people. Who, hey, there you go. <laughs> Anybody else classics majors? God forbid classic professors? <laughs> All right. Feel free to correct me, particularly uh, pronunciations, uh, but that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and then we'll talk about how that reflects in my writing and some of the things I've learned about good storytelling uh, over the past six years of, of trying to put some thoughts to paper about the practice of medicine. Uh, so let's begin with a couple of opening lines. Listen to this opening line, if you will. Rage. Sing, goddess. The rage of Peleus' son Achilles. So murderous, so doomed, that caused the destruction of so many Achaeans. What's that from? 50 50 shot deal. Yeah. yeah. Homer only wrote that by two things. <laughs> so, that, those are the opening lines of the Iliad, which is the oldest story in the Western canon. It's the oldest piece of Western literature that, that exists. So I like to be thorough and start you know, right from the beginning, and then we'll take you all the way through Western literature in an hour and a half here. Uh, now consider this opening line. It wasn't clear to me whether he'd won or lost the machete fight. But it was clear to me he was about to lose the gunfight. That's from one of my stories uh, in the Crow's Age. Is that it's a true story about uh, an, an episode of the emergency department, and the similarities are somewhat striking. Uh, both scenes open with warriors. Uh, both hold the promise of danger, of violence, of tragedy, of destruction. Uh, and the similarities are certainly not intentional. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to try and write the next Iliad, uh, but they may be inevitable in some ways, uh, given the way that medical storytelling has co-evolved along the same lines as uh, Homeric storytelling. Uh, so let's go back uh, and review really briefly. The Iliad is a story set in the Trojan War, uh, and the listeners of the Iliad would have all the background information, so they didn't really need to know too much to hear about the story of the Iliad, which is good because the Iliad didn't actually tell the story of the Trojan War. It ends before uh, the destruction of Troy, it ends before Achilles' death, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The Trojan horse is never mentioned in it. So let's just quickly go over that, that early mythology because I think it's, it's good uh, general literacy knowledge to have that. So the Trojan War was started, as most of you know, uh, Paris went over to Greece as a guest of Menelaus and stole his wife, Helen. Helen of Sparta. Uh, she was the most beautiful woman in the world, and he, she'd been promised to him by Aphrodite in her, in, as a bride so she could win a beauty contest. Uh, she didn't tell Paris that Helen was already married, which was quite, quite a wrinkle as a proof later in the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know the story. So he takes her to Troy. Uh, Priam, the king of Troy, his father is delighted. Paris is finally settling down. Hector, his older brother, is pissed because he's always pissed at Paris. Paris gets all the ladies. Paris has all the, the musical abilities. Hector's one out to do all the fighting and heavy lifting, uh, so he's not as fond of Helen. Uh, and of course, Menelaus was away when, when Helen got uh, taken, and he's pretty angry when he gets back. And he enlists the aid of his brother, Agamemnon, and they uh, rally all the uh, Greek states. It wasn't really Greece back then, it was Achaea. Uh, and they all, after a delay of many years, eight years, finally set sail for uh, Troy to get Helen back. They try some diplomatic maneuvers, it doesn't work, uh, and they besiege the city. Uh, and so that, that's where the, the, uh, the Iliad picks up in the 10th year of the war, and it covers 51 days, and it talks, as the opening line says, about the rage of Achilles. And who was Achilles so mad at? He was mad at everybody. That was part of his genius, I guess, or his gift. Uh, but mostly he was mad at Agamemnon, his ally, because Agamemnon did what uh, started the war in the first place. He took Achilles' uh, girlfriend, basically, because he was the boss, and he got to do that. So Achilles refused to fight. Uh, the Greeks began to lose. Lots of other interventions by the gods and goddesses. Uh, finally, Achilles goes back into battle and he gets mad. His uh, cousin, some say boyfriend, Patroclus, uh, gets killed. So he, he joins the fight, and the tide begins to turn for the Trojans. Uh, and that's pretty much where it leaves off. He kills the best fighter in Troy, Hector, uh, and in a most ugly display, drags his body around the city walls three times, 
Uh, if any of you are old enough to remember uh, Somalia and uh, watching our, our troops get dragged around, you can understand the, the desecration that that involved. Uh, and that, that's basically where the Iliad ends. Where the story ends, the Greeks sail off, hide, hide offshore a little ways. Uh, they leave behind the Trojan horse, uh, Odysseus's idea. Odysseus was the clever one. Uh, they take the horse, they get drunk. Uh, the soldiers climb out of the horse, sack the city, uh, kill almost everybody, take Helen back. Helen and Menelaus end up living happily ever after. Pretty much the only two who do. Um, <laughs> Odysseus, I suppose. Agamemnon goes home to find out that his wife uh, had taken another. Uh, and the two of them, the wife and the lover, actually kill Agamemnon. Uh, so he didn't come out too good, but he probably had it coming. Uh, <laughs> for various reasons. Uh, so that is, in brief, the story. Uh, and it's a very, very old story. And it wasn't written down at the time of the Trojan War. Uh, the Trojan War probably occurred around 1184 BC. Uh, again, without any written records, it's hard to say for sure. But based on ancient Greek historians using family memories uh, and temple records at the time, place the, uh, the Trojan War around 1184 BC. Um, but the Iliad wasn't penned for 400 years. Homer finally wrote it down it's four centuries later. Um, it was handed down orally from person to person to person for 400 years. And essentially, it seems probably fairly accurately. Uh, we'll talk about why that may be true. Uh, there was a reason it took him so long to uh, write it down. The Greeks uh, forgot how to write during uh, the Greek Dark Ages. Just after the fall of Troy, Greek civilization collapsed as well. Uh, no one really knows why, but they went into the Dark Ages. And they had a, a way to communicate it, a syllabus called uh, Linear B, uh, which is more of a syllabic script from pictographs. And it was uh, only known to a guild of scribes who worked for the palaces. Uh, and when the palace culture collapsed, no one could employ the scribes, so no one knew uh, how to speak or to write down this linear B. Linear B was primarily a transactional uh, script. It was, you know, how many cows were sold, how many dogs, how many horses. Uh, it wasn't really a literary script. You couldn't really tell stories, or at least none had ever been found uh, in linear B, and, and a lot of linear B tablets have been found. I like uh, the fact that everything old is new again in some ways. Where's Anthony? Is he uh, there? There he is. Uh, Anthony's a scribe in our emergency department. So here we are 3,000 years later, <clears throat> and we've gone back to using scribes to record our medical records. And the reason is uh, that uh, our electronic medical record is sort of a very, very high-tech linear B script. It is transactional. Uh, I can use it. All you do is push some buttons. Uh, but it doesn't tell any story at all. Uh, it will generate a bill, uh, which is a good thing for me. But in, in order to get the stories down, we need to free text stuff in. Uh, and if you grew up in my generation, you didn't really learn to type. And certainly, these, everyone who knows how to text now and type uh, is much faster than the doctor. So we employ these scribes to keep our medical records, uh, tell the stories well. I like that symmetry that comes back so many years later to still use these scribes. Uh, so, where were we? Um, so we were talking about uh, the Homer writing it all down, and how do we know that this, this really uh, is an accurate reflection of the Trojan War? Uh, did the Trojan War actually exist at all? Did it even happen? Uh, is there any historical record for that? I think to answer that, we have to look at the Iliad and the problems uh, over the centuries that scholars have had with deciphering the Iliad. Uh, it's broadly grouped as the Homeric question. But it's really a series of questions around the structure of the Iliad, and the Odyssey too, but for the purposes of this talk, because it's much easier to trace the history of, of the Iliad, we'll do that. So the Iliad is 15,693 lines long. It's a very, very long song, okay, it's meant to be sung. If you actually tried to sing it like the classic club used to do many years ago, you'd find that you probably couldn't. It takes over 24 hours. And they, on Homer's birthday, they gather up the statue and try and read through the Iliad. And it's a noble effort it, in shifts. Uh, they never quite got through it. Uh, so that's the first question. What was the purpose of such a long song? Who possibly could remember it and sing it, first of all? Because remember, they didn't have it written down. Uh, 
Uh, and who would you send it to? Uh, imagine the size of the icon you would need if you wanted to record a couple of these things. The Odyssey was something as well. Uh, so that's one Homeric question. What was, how was it utilized? What was the point? Why is it so long? Uh, another question with the structure of the, the Iliad is, is the repetitiveness of it. So about one-fifth of the Iliad is sheer repetition. And it's not, you know, that, the question is, why is it? And throughout centuries, people have said, well, that's Homer's genius. He's repeated some really key uh, themes and repeated some really key phrases to emphasize them. And, and that's, that's how you have to read the Iliad. Uh, but it's not clear where, what the other constraints were. Was the audience, you know, were they not very, uh, did they not pay attention very well? Did they need to have this thing repeated over and over again? Uh, or were there just a bunch of redundancies? So that brings us to the, the next question regarding the length. Could one person have written all this? And that's been debated back and forth. It now seems with very advanced linguistic analysis of the text of uh, the Iliad and Odyssey that they probably all were written by one single author. From, who knows if it was really Homer, but clearly one person sat down at some point uh, and wrote down the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, and so, uh, <coughs> We, we seem to agree on that now. Uh, but why is it structured that way? Uh, if it really represented a historical uh, event, the first thing that would have to be true is that the city of Troy would exist. Uh, and the city of Troy doesn't exist. You know, at least throughout modern times, no one was able to find the city of Troy. Uh, in the ancient world, it seemed clear that Troy existed. Xerxes, uh, the Persian, uh, reported visiting the ruins of Troy uh, and stopped there to perform some ceremonies honoring the fighters on his way to Thermopylae to defeat the Greeks. A uh, hundred years later, Alexander the Great, with his Greeks, on their way to defeat the Persians, under Darius III, also stopped at what was known to be Troy at the time. Uh, but again, even at that time, it was in the ruins. Uh, the Apostle Paul, probably the latest uh, and last person to report, uh, visiting the site of Troy. In, in the Acts, he reports several visits with, with Luke uh, through the Troad, the region right around uh, where the city of Troy would have been in control. So, but even back then, it wasn't known for sure. And after that, the actual location of Troy was lost in, into history. No one knew where it was. And throughout the Romantic era, it was common for people to um, go on sort of Homeric tours and things. They take a copy of the Iliad, sometimes the Odyssey, uh, although that's less geographic, and try and find the sites that Homer mentioned. And everybody was excited and, and reported that they could actually find the site. But it's all pretty nebulous. Uh, Homer wasn't really a geographer, uh, it's often been said. Uh, so that's how the situation remained uh, for many, many, many years until we come to uh, the first <coughs> character in our story of of uh, searching for the city of Troy. This is Heinrich Schliemann. Uh, he came on the scene in 1870. He began looking for Troy. He was a, he was a very, very talented guy, uh, but a, a bit of a scoundrel. He was a pathologic prevaricator. He, he lied about everything. Uh, he was uh, probably a crook in a lot of his business dealings. Uh, but he was a self-taught Homeric scholar. He could write, recite uh, very long passages of the Iliad and the Odyssey from memory. And he was also a really good linguist. He taught himself 14 languages he could converse in uh, fluently uh, by himself. Uh, Arabic, Dutch, Greek, ancient Greek. Uh, he made a bunch of fortunes. First in uh, Europe, he, uh, he was German. He learned to speak Russian and became a trading agent made a lot of money, went to America uh, during the California gold rush and made a fortune speculating on gold dust, left the country under a cloud when the, his competitor, the Rothschild Bank, uh, started circulating uh, a rumor that he was short, short weighting the gold miners. Uh, he claimed he had ill health and had to leave in a hurry, uh, but leave he did. Uh, he reported that on his way out having dinner with Miller Fillmore, the president at the time, which never happened. Uh, he, was, he gave a first-hand report of the, the San Francisco fire in 1851. Uh, he was clearly in another part of the state. Uh, just printed it right out of the newspaper, uh, but published it under his own name. Uh, so he was a character. Uh, he went back to Russia and married a, a lady uh, who was unsatisfied with his fortune, which was 
apparently pretty big, uh, insisted he make more money. He went to the Crimea, made a, th a third fortune. Uh, he cornered the market in saltpeter and sulfur. And, and during the war, those things are used to make uh, gunpowder. So he made an enormous fortune, left Russia, claimed to have uh, divorced his wife while he was in Indiana, forgot to tell her, uh, and, <laughs> and retired. Yeah, no record of that either. Uh, he also claimed to be a U.S. citizen, but uh, that was curious, uh, at least his application was. But he, he retired, and he did what he wanted to do all his, his life, which was to find Troy. He was fascinated by the Iliad, uh, and now he had the money and the time to do it. The first thing he did was he wrote his thesis in ancient Greek uh, and turned it into a university in Germany. He had self-taught in ancient Greek. Uh, and a PhD in absentia from a university in Germany. So he often went to Greece without a wife and felt like he needed a helpmate. He took out an ad in the newspaper, because that was even more common back in those days, and found a 17-year-old. Uh, yeah, he got his little wife, uh, Sophie. Sophie and Gaspar Nemos, uh, the 17, she was the niece of the Archbishop of Athens. Uh, who was a personal friend of Shane's, and they got married. Uh, and she, she was the same. She was a passionate uh, devotee of the Iliad and could recite long passages from memory. So the two of them went to where Schleiman thought he knew where uh, Troy was. And this is where, I don't have a pointer, but uh, if you go know, way up there, there, right there, that's where he thought Troy was, uh, based on some geographic clues that Homer had uh, mentioned in the Iliad. Uh, you could see Mount Ida from the summit of where he said Troy was, which was in the Iliad. It was near these two island, islands of Imbros and Tenedos. Uh, Tenedos, in fact, is where the ships probably pulled in when they left Greece, waiting for them to bring the Trojan horse in, the Bay of Tenedos there, and sailed back. It's right near the hell spot, that is that narrow strip of, of water that drains all of southern uh, Europe, uh, and it also is situated on an alluvial plain. Uh, many of the other sites that uh, he looked at, he rejected because they had ravines cut into them. This one had a plain all the way around where he thought he was going to get in, and you'd, you'd need to be able to go ride around it three times, dragging Hector behind you. So he thought, well, that's, that's probably it. Uh, so he began to dig in a place called Hisarlik, which is a uh, tell. Tells are big piles of dirt uh, based on many layers of civilization having, having been there before. Uh, Tel Aviv is a, is a tell you might have heard of over in uh, Israel. Uh, so the Tel Aviv Sarlik, which means the fortress in Turkish, uh, was where he began to dig. And he dug and dug and dug. Archaeology hadn't really been established uh, as a discipline back in those days. Uh, there weren't accepted techniques. Uh, and so unfortunately, in digging for Troy, Schleiman. Uh, did something the Greeks were almost unable to do in their entire lifetime, because he, he brought down all the city walls, finally, uh, with his <laughs> techniques. But he did find the, the walls of a stone city, uh, very deep down in the earth, uh, and he proclaimed it as Troy uh, in 1872, I think. He said, I found Troy. And not only that, but he found extraordinary treasures. Uh, this is Sophie wearing uh, Priam's treasure, these beautiful, Unfortunately, it's not color, uh, but these beautiful golden uh, jewelry and uh, adornments uh, that he found while everybody else was on a break from digging, and suddenly he comes up with this bundle and says, look what I found. Uh, and that's sort of how he operated for his entire career. There would be many more instances like that. Uh, and he published that, too, which uh, delighted the Turkish government because they thought it was theirs. Uh, and so once again, he had to hightail it out of the country uh, with the authorities on his yeah, it's uh, still a long contention for his treasure. Uh, so he had discovered Troy. Unfortunately, what he discovered was a city a thousand years older than Troy. Uh, and so it, it clearly wasn't Troy. But he did excite enough of the, the budding uh, world of archaeology uh, to go and explore a little more carefully the site of Troy. And what they found was there were 18 different civilizations that had built habitations to tell it to uh, And at the level seven, actually, they found a city that was destroyed by fire in 1190 BC, roughly, around 1200. Right about the time Troy would have been 
destroyed by fire. And so and there were skeletons laying around and weapons and stuff like that. And it was pretty clear that this city had been sacked by an invading force. So was this Troy? There were no written records in the city. There's nothing to tell us that the exact Troy. And so much was destroyed uh, while digging uh, that it's going to be really hard to say. This is what Schliemann found uh, originally, some of the original walls. Uh, this is a more modern excavation of the site, which I'm going to call Troy. This is two sacred springs mentioned in the uh, Iliad there inside the city walls. Uh, and it looks a lot like it could have been Troy, except it's too small. You know, this was a city that 100,000 Greeks couldn't besiege. Uh, they couldn't get around it. There weren't enough of them. Uh, and you know, Troy had a lot of allies, including the Amazons, the legendary all-women uh, warrior tribe, who were allies of Troy and fought in the, in the Trojan War. Uh, but recently, uh, more sophisticated archaeology has found that Troy actually is a lot bigger than originally thought. And in fact, that's an artist's rendering pretty much of how uh, Homer described Troy. Uh, and I think we have found Troy, and most modern archaeologists think it's more likely than not that this is indeed Troy. Further evidence comes from some geologists uh, and hydrologists working at the site to recognize that over the three centuries, a lot of silting in had, had uh, occurred. And as Troy was now too far from the hell to actually be Troy, it actually was a lot closer 3,000 years ago. The reason Troy is there uh, is because of one key feature. If you look at the hell spot, that thing that runs right through the middle of it, uh, it's very narrow. You can't really tack up and down it, especially with a square sail ship. Uh, so if you wanted to go up to the Black Sea or out to the Aegean, you had to wait until the wind was favorable. And Troy was the place you would wait. Uh, the, the, well protected natural bay uh, with good resources that you could reprovision with. Uh, this whole peninsula here of Anatolia, including Mount Ida, up to the Hellespont Canal, uh, is all part of what used to be called Anatolia, uh, or the Hittite Kingdom back in uh, the 1200s. Uh, and recently, interestingly, some Hittite documents have been uh, decoded, and they record uh, around 1200, uh, that they made a truce with the, somebody called the Achaeans uh, over the city of what they said was Lelusia, which, uh, if you go back to ancient Greek from the Hittite language and translate that, probably is Ilion, which is another name for Troy. So we think Homer probably at least documented a real event for the Trojan War. Uh, but how accurate was the rest of his history? Uh, Did it really come down accurately over 400 years of war transmission? Book two of the Iliad uh, is the famous catalog of ships, a thousand plus ships, you know, the face that launched a thousand ships. And it talks about where each ship came from, who commanded it, who staffed it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And many of the places that the ships came from were described in detail by Homer, but were no longer ha inhabited by the time that Homer wrote this all down. He wouldn't have had any real first-hand way to know places like Mycenae, where Agamemnon was from, uh, and other places like that. And he described them in some detail, and Schliemann was one of the first, but many other modern archaeologists have dug there and found large palaces. There was no palace culture during Homer's time. Uh, the, the, the entire way of living had, had changed quite a bit. So clearly he was conveying accurately events which he would have no way of knowing firsthand, and certainly no way of talking to somebody who actually knew them. It was 400 years later. So allow for a moment that the Iliad is true, that it's accurate. It's not vital to my argument that you believe that, because uh, we'll talk a little bit more about other, other uh, truths from the Iliad. But allow for a moment that it's true. If that is indeed true, the question really comes up, how did Homer remember all that stuff? How did he know this? Uh, and that's where we come into the structure of the Iliad and some later uh, scholars that we'll talk about in just a minute. But the Iliad is structured, uh, it's oral form of language poetry, and it's written in dactylic hexameter. Dactyl is the Greek word uh, for finger. And if you look at your own finger, you have one long uh, phalanx and then two short phalanges, okay? Uh, 
two short, one long syllable followed by two short syllables repeated six times is that till it gets hammered. And the entire song is written in very strictly in that till it gets hammered. So that's part of what we need to understand uh, and, and why this all worked. Uh, the key to really understanding came uh, only in the last century with a guy by the name of Milman Parry. Uh, Milman Parry was a classic, uh, a classicist trained in Berkeley, uh, and his PhD work at the Sorbonne in France. His advisor urged him to go and do field work uh, in the former Yugoslavia. And Milman Parry went there and found out why his advisor sent him there. At that time in Bosnia, there was, in all these small towns, itinerant singers would, would pass through the town and they'd sing these long, epic folk tales about the local heroes and their exploits that they'd done. And it, it caught Milman Parry's ear because he, he, he knew so much about the Iliad and that this was the same structure, the same annoying repetition, uh, the same use of stock formulas, uh, the same use of epithets, and we'll talk about what those are. Uh, and he came out, in 1928, he published his thesis, which was that uh, the uh, Iliad was clearly meant to be sung, it was clearly meant to be composed on the spot uh, by these, these bards, these rhapsodes, they were actually called uh, back in, in Homer's time, and that uh, there was very likely uh, possibility that they were accurately recorded every single time due to some of the, the features of the oral formula, uh, these epithets. Uh, so everybody in the Iliad uh, has an epithet, and you guys can play along if you remember any of them. Uh, how does the swift foot and Achilles and line RC are off? Epithets are uh, nouns uh, modified by compound adjectives, so rosy fingered dawn, things like that, wine dark sea. So here's your chance. Uh, other epithets in the Iliad or the Odyssey? What is it? Grey Athena. Grey Athena, definitely. Yeah. Hector, Tamer, Breaker of Horses, yeah. Nestor sometimes referred to that, uh, but Hector for sure. Uh, yeah. Very good. Lord of Men, yeah. Menelaus of the Strong War Cry. Uh, some of the more obscure ones, at least. Uh, Apollo, Slayer of Mice. Um, <laughs> Woman Raping Ares. Ares always got a bad rap. He was blood, was manslaughtering Ares. Blood slaying Ares. Woman Raping Ares. Uh, so things like that. Everybody has at least. Uh, one epithet, most people have several epithets, uh, and the epithets are of defined length. Uh, and so, if you just started in the meter and wanted to tell the story, you could easily fit in the epithets uh, and remember it easily. Great eyed Athena awoke to the rosy fingered dawn, gazed out over the wine dark sea to see the hollow body, body ships and Greeks being led by Agamemnon, Lord of Men. Uh, so you could tell a story pretty easily if you could remember those epitaphs, you could remember a few stock phrases, uh, and we had this Homeric phraseology, a group of words which is regularly employed under the same metrical conditions to express a given essential idea. And so what he showed was that it was possible to remember a, a, a composition that is as long as uh, the Iliad and reproduce it faithfully. So whether or not it really actually told uh, a, tale, a true tale of the Trojan War. It doesn't really matter. What it did show was an extraordinary uh, mnemonic trip, really, a feat of memory uh, and a way to organize a story uh, so that you can tell it the same way every single time. So, which leaves us with the question, why would anybody bother to memorize a story like this? And the answer is, it seems that in uh, the classical period of Greece, they would have festivals, and at the festivals they'd have contests uh, to see who could recite uh, Homer the best. Homer was the foundation of all uh, ancient learning. If you didn't know the two texts of Homer, uh, you were not an educated person. Uh, we talked about Alexander the Great. His teacher was Aristotle, who gave him his personal copy of the Iliad to take with him on all his conquests. So they get together at these festivals, and these rhapsodes, that were their names, rhapsodes, uh, are, which uh, the literal translation is sower of songs. They would weave together, stitch together, long compositions, much shorter uh, pieces. Uh, 
and there were prizes for the best uh, recitation of Homer. And so these things were highly prized, memory uh, and theatrical ability. So they'd sing these songs, but you got it randomly assigned to it. Uh, you didn't have to sing the whole thing. You got like 20 minutes uh, to get up there and pick up the story where the last guy had left off. Uh, and so you'd be competing against each other. And it puts me in mind of uh, how many of you have ever watched the movie Eight Mile? Uh, <laughs> Eminem, you know, doing this uh, rap battle. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, it has its moments. So that's uh, what we learned about uh, Milman Perry and, and the oral formulaic tradition. What does any of this have to do with medicine? Okay, and for that, I would like to, get, uh, to share with you some of my writing, and I think it'll help you understand what this has to do with medicine, where the hook is, uh, where it carries over. This is called <clears throat> A Night in the Life. The damp streets of Charlottesville are quiet at 11 p.m. as I drive in to begin my ER shift. Lightning splits the dark sky and illuminates ominous thunderheads. Three cop cars are parked in front of the ER. I walk through a waiting room full of the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning for free medical care. As I put on my white coat, an overhead page calls for security to bed 34, stat. A show of force quiets the unruly patient, and I settle in to take sign out from my colleague. It is Saturday night in the ER. I inherit a typical patient load, a GSW, gunshot wound, to the face, multiple MDAs, motor vehicle accidents, a Peds versus auto, that's a pedestrian struck by a car, chronic abdominal pains, intoxicated regulars, suicidal regulars, sick kids, sick adults. I have a great team on with me tonight, experienced nurses, bright residents, willing medical students. By virtue of training and inclination, we are happiest in the ED in the midst of trauma, chaos, and illness, and Saturday night is a distillation of all that. An eager but inexperienced intern presents the first new patient of the night, a sad and moving case of domestic abuse with multiple facial bruises evident. The case quickly turns bizarre when I see the patient and gently wipe off her bruises with a damp piece of gauze. Call sight. It is Saturday night in the ER. We move on. Noses bleed, gums bleed, brains bleed, toothaches throb, houses catch on fire, Little old ladies fall down and can't get up. Little old men get confused when the sun goes down. Widows get lonely. Kids wake up in the middle of the night crying. Outside hospitals call to transfer problem patients. It is Saturday night in the ER. A young man is stabbed in the back at a party. He doesn't know who did it or why, but he is supremely unconcerned. All trauma. I spend an hour catching up with the happenings of the night as seen through the eyes of the cops. And finally, my night is complete. A 27-year-old male arrives at 0500 to report difficulty sleeping. I walk outside to see the warm dawn coming, the sky overhead clearing. It is Sunday morning, and I am going home to bed. Sleep well, Charlottesville. So when we, when we change over shifts, uh, we tell 30 to 50 stories of patients. Uh, and we have to transfer this information accurately, obviously, to the next caregiver. I'm going to take over up to 50 of my colleagues' patients, and he's going to tell me a little story about each one of them. Almost all my colleagues are very diligent, and I appreciate them for it, and write this stuff down. You know, check the FCT, make sure the belly labs are okay. But I, I don't write anything down. I do it all from memory. Not because I'm smarter than they are, but because I use, I recognize this formulaic storytelling, and I use it uh, to remember the stories, and I'll show you how I do that. Uh, so we have our own tradition here, our own meter. This is our meter. Our meter is the structure of the medical story, and it never varies. Like Homer, you can't deviate from the form. It, it would be chaos if you did. Uh, and you spend a long time learning the form. The interns aren't very good at it. Uh, give me this. Anthony's struggling because you know, he's really drill them down. They'll start with this rambling story. This is a 25-year-old lady who three years ago uh, was in a car crash, but didn't really get hurt, and then went home, and then uh, two years ago she had pneumonia, but that didn't really bother me. It's like, wait a minute, I can't organize any of this information. This is way too long of a story. Our story always starts with the chief complaint. 
And the chief complaint is a single, information-dense sentence uh, in which we almost always apply epitaphs to the patients. Patients are all come with epitaphs attached. 50-year-old, morbidly obese female. 23-year-old, floridly psychotic male. Uh, <laughs> these kind of things. Everybody has an epitaph in my world, too, in my chief complaint. And so you have to drill down and distill the chief complaint because people often don't really, haven't really thought of it as a single chief complaint. Uh, and that's where some editorial function is exercised and where some skill comes in. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about chief complaints uh, in my next rosé is that piece. Uh, <clears throat> chief complaints. I am in the complaint business. Every day at work in the ER, 30 to 50 people come to me to complain about something. We call the first sentence of the clinical encounter the chief complaint. These can be documented very succinctly as long as you know the acronyms. Short of breath, for example, does not or SOP, for example, does not describe a patient's personality, but rather that they are short of breath. See, I translate these things right in my head. Uh, <laughs> LOLs do not make you laugh out loud unless you think little old ladies are amusing. <laughs> they can be. <laughs> there is certainly nothing amusing about LOL squared, that is, little old ladies lying on linoleum. That's a poor little old lady who's fallen and broken her hip uh, and can't get off the bathroom floor. LOL squared. Uh, foosh! Uh, they sound like the sound one makes falling on an outstretched uh, hand, but it's actually an acronym for the most common mechanism for wrist fractures. FOS, on the other hand, means full of stool, uh, and that uh, is usually not a personality descriptor, but rather a way to describe constipation. <laughs> Dips may have character flaws, but they may just be drunk in public. Dips may also frequently have CHIs, closed head injuries, i.e. hit the head but without a laceration or a fracture. Sometimes the acronyms obscure meaning, though. I was trying recently to ascertain the medic's meaning while looking at an extremely combative patient brought in by ambulance from the downtown mall. This is a lady who's tied up to a board, shouting and spitting and cursing. Uh, they were describing a possible CHI, exact mechanism unknown, possible LOC, loss of consciousness, Question OD, overdose, and ALOC, altered level of consciousness. Fortunately, there was a Shawsville City cop with the crew, and I asked him, Officer, do you know anything about this? She was in a drunken brawl with another broad, Doc. Ah, clarity. So much of what can happen to you is so common to us that we have acronyms for nearly every complaint. CVAs are cerebral vascular accidents, strokes. MDAs are motor vehicle accidents. GSWs, as you've already heard, are gunshot wounds. SI means self-inflicted, except when it means suicidal ideation. Sometimes it can mean both, as in GSW slash SI. Dialysis patients have surgically created arterial to venous shunts put in for dialysis. When they are flowing well, the characteristic healthy vibration is called in medical terms a thrill. Thus, the chief complaint, the thrill is gone, is not just a B.B. King song or a marital complaint. There's a lot of dialysis. <laughs> Patients have their own medical slang for their chief complaints, which can be perplexing or illustrative. Michael Jackson pneumonia is mycoplasma pneumonia, which I have seen. But I have yet to see a walking pneumonia, despite the many patients who claim to have it. Perhaps it doesn't start walking until it is crowded out by double pneumonia, another puzzling medical term. I suppose if you had Michael Jackson pneumonia turn into walking pneumonia, it would be moonwalking pneumonia. <laughs> Double moonwalking pneumonia, if possible, would be a real thriller. <laughs> Not that it might be too soon, but... Uh... <laughs> spinal meningitis can, might seem as common as spinal meningitis, which is itself a nonsensical term. Perhaps that was what was brewing in the lady who told me she was in the ER because she was trying to have a headache. I must admit, she came to the right place. <laughs> so those are chief complaints. That's how we structure uh, the chief complaint. Uh, then we move to the HBI, the history of the present illness, and that is as tightly formatted as the chief complaint. A single paragraph uh, using stock phrases and epithets to convey what it is, uh, how the patient's illness has progressed to the point where they need to come into the emergency department. And then we use stock phrases, the morbidly obese lady presents with a three-day history of was in her usual state of poor health until three days prior to admission, PTA, 
when she noticed the onset of, and people are always status post things, they never just have things happen to them, status post liver transplants, status post double lung transplant. Uh, so uh, that's the HPI. Then we move to that kind of review. Review of system is going to come around here. Right Mostly we just go to the physical exam, and again, a bunch of stock phrases creep in. Uh, this patient in question is sitting bolt upright, usually to protect their airway. Tripoding is another common one, <laughs> like you do after a race to help you get more air into your lungs. Uh, unable to tolerate your own secretions, or somebody else's secretions for that matter. Uh, and visibly tiring. So these are all stock phrases. So right there, just using some stock phrases, I've told a, a story. Uh, a lady with a double lung transplant, gasping for air, clearly uh, needs my help uh, sooner rather than later. And that's how we uh, transmit information in a medical sense, and it's very much an oral formulaic tradition uh, that we have. Uh, so that's a little bit about basic medical reporting. Uh, but I'd like to be a little bit more than just an efficient reporter of medical facts. Uh, I would like to achieve something that's called narrative competence. And the reason I want narrative competence is because it protects me uh, from burnout. Uh, if all you're doing is a technician and you're listening to 50 people complain about their illnesses or your recitals you call them sometimes, you know, oh my God, I'm that. Uh, then you can suffer from compassion fatigue, from, from burnout, from caregiver fatigue. Uh, and this is a real thing. And so I try, uh, oh, this is uh, something I didn't tell about. We'll back up. Uh, it doesn't matter. I was trying to tell a story without using a single actual word. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to read that, uh, Anthony, maybe? Would you mind reading that for us? 50 year old male complaining short of breath, just beyond exertion. Uh, yeah. Carrick says, well, nocturnal dips in so he has to get up in the middle of the night gasping for breath. Has no history, coronary artery bypass grafts, coronary artery disease, and semi my heart of abortion, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, uh, just heart failure, meds and blue hydrochloric triazide, aspirin, uh, APAP, I'm not familiar with APAP is a chemical abbreviation for Tylenol. Okay. So you yeah. have to make it complicated. You can't just say Tylenol. Yeah. And you use nitrogen, social screw, alcohol, uh, two pack day smoker, physical exam, BP, 196 solid, over 100 diastolic, depression is 25, plus 1. 89% That's the part that troubled you? <laughs> so see the medical knowledge that you can pick up by being described in the evening. It's not just recording history, it's known what they need. Uh, and Jamie's in fact here knows what the rest of them. So my lot of around with the fragment sounds in his lungs. He's got some uh, different heart sounds. These neck veins are all swollen up. Uh, so you've got CHF and hypertension, and then the plan is BiPAP, which is a uh, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, we're going to come to this in a later story. BiPAP uh, pushes air into your lungs when you take a breath in, uh, and as you breathe out, it gives you a little bit of positive pressure resistance in order to keep your airways open so they don't collapse <coughs> as you exhale. So that's BiPAP. Uh, versus endotracheal intubation, which is a more invasive uh, next step that we don't like to take if we don't have to. Uh, nitroplase, morphine, and then force phase. So, very good. Some of those uh, are not things we always cover in the emergency department. Uh, but this narrative confidence is something that I'm interested in, and one of the reasons I like to do this medical writing, uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do it. Uh, narrative confidence is the set of skills required to recognize, absorb, interpret, and be moved by the stories one hears or reads. It's the ability also to tell true stories. Uh, and so, I'm interested in how it is that you become a good storyteller. Uh, everyone's a storyteller now. Bloggers, tweeters, uh, Facebook posters. I'm probably not even covering the campus, that kind of things you guys are doing online, communicate to each other. Uh, so everybody is a writer, everybody's a storyteller. And certainly, within your own circle of friends, you're constantly telling stories. And so this should interest you as well. How do you become a good storyteller? I had a good fortune for David Morris uh, when he was active on campus here in the English department in his uh, illness narratives uh, course. And 
David says this, most murder mysteries need a body, and they need it quick. Without a body, there is no crime, no mystery, no suspense, and therefore no reader curiosity. Most writings in this frame is a mystery, a central question that the reader wants help answer. So that's one easy way to reframe every story as a murder mystery. But along the lines of needing a body uh, and needing it fast, <coughs> That is one of my stock in trade, I should say, because of the, the uh, stories I have from the emergency department. We get bodies and we get them fast. Here's, here's a good example. Uh, Lewis was a typical victim I cared for years ago. Five years old, he had been left alone to wander out the back door to the fenced backyard where the family's six Rottweilers tore his throat out. The dogs stood guard over their prize and kept the rescuers at bay. The police were afraid to shoot lest they hit the boy. Finally, an intrepid ambulance worker simply climbed the fence and ignored the dogs and picked the boy up. <clears throat> the waiting helicopter crew was able to easily intubate him because they could see the top of his lungs and trachea exposed by the massive tissue loss. He had no pulse and they infused whole blood into him on the scene. By the time he reached us, he had a pulse and the trauma team went to work on the numerous life-threatening injuries to his torso and limbs. Remarkably, Lewis survived, but he required a hospital stay of over a year and a nearly continuous series of surgeries to reconstruct his face, esophagus, and neck. We took the pieces of his ribs, rebuilt him a jaw, uh, we built a, a tongue for him, I forget how parts of his thumb, uh, we put part of his small intestine up into his chest to be his esophagus. The kid was in agony, he was constantly, every time he recovered enough to go to surgery, he went back to surgery. Uh, his family drifted away and eventually came to see him only sporadically, usually monthly or less. They refused to allow the dogs to be killed. Lewis thrived in the hospital despite the ordeals he was undergoing. He became the mascot of the hard bitten trauma surgery residence and he had to run of the hospital. Everyone knew him and he could be found anywhere in the hospital. He would come down to the ER dragging his little IV pole uh, to come say hi to us, uh, usually with a resident or a nurse somewhere nearby. He was charming but quite spoiled as he got whatever he wanted from the protective residence. Ultimately, Lewis returned home upon the family's promise to keep the dogs kenneled if the backyard was in use. Lewis's charmed year had ended. So that's getting a body and getting it fast. Again, I have an advantage. My new you. Another important part of storytelling, and particularly story writing, but storytelling as well, is dialogue. <clears throat> That's a placeholder there. Uh, dialogue really makes stories come alive. Uh, it's one of the more challenging things to do. Uh, those of you who like Elmore Leonard recognize his unique uh, style of dialogue. Uh, Hemingway had an entirely different, uh, maybe not even a realistic style of dialogue. Let me give you an example of what I consider dialogue moving the story along. <clears throat> Law and order. During my 20 years of ER practice, I have seen the inside of many courtrooms. Now don't judge, it wasn't our practice that landed me there. I have been called as the treating physician to testify to the injury patterns inflicted on my patients. I have been subpoenaed in cases of child abuse, felony assault, and even attempted murder. Most doctors are smart enough to avoid these impositions on their time, not this one. Like most fans of the TV show Law and Order, I have always been curious about the workings of the criminal justice system, and so I go when I can. From my outsider's perspective, it can appear at times to be a tragic comic theater. <coughs> these are actual exchanges from a trial I testified in. Judge, do you feel you've had enough time with your attorney to prepare for this case? Defendant, no sir, he never comes to see me in jail. Public defender, I object. Judge, do you object to your own client? Uh, well, no, Your Honor, but he has refused to see me on several occasions when I visited him in jail. Judge, is this true? Defendant, I was busy. <laughs> Judge, do you feel your attorney has adequately assisted you in your defense? Defendant, uh, I don't know. What do most people say? Judge, in what way do you feel unsure? Well, for one thing, he never talked to my alibi witness. I object again, Your Honor. Please, Counselor. Public Defender. He gave me the first name only and the address of a vacant lot. I spent two hours there but could not locate the so-called witness. <laughs> Defendant. 
and he moved. <laughs> and so the wheels of justice grind on. I'm always happy to get back to the ER, where my patients always tell me the truth. Uh, so they know always telling the truth. <clears throat> One of the most overused tropes in storytelling, and certainly in writing, is metaphor and its close cousin simile. Uh, they're, they're easy to use, uh, but often overused. Uh, but it is another uh, hallmark of how to turn storytelling into good storytelling. And so I want you to listen for the metaphor. Metaphor, we already said, is something that links the familiar with the unfamiliar. Uh, so let's see if you can hear the metaphors in here. <clears throat> I know you want to hear the end of this story anyways, but we started at the hour with All Bleeding Stops Eventually. That's going to be the title of my book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was not clear to me whether he had won or lost the machete fight, but it was clear to me that he was about to lose the gunfight. He was standing in the center of the ER waiting room, still clutching his machete, surrounded by five cops with their guns drawn. With their guns all pointed essentially at each other, in a waiting room full of patients, there were actually going to be a lot of losers. The patient was covered completely, was covered head to toe in bright red blood. The blood was dripping down his lens and off the machete. There was too much blood. It couldn't all be his. Sheets of blood coursed down his long hair and obscured his face. A gaping scalp wound, scalp wound cleaved his head front to back in its way, ghastly mimicking parted hand. He was mumbling in incomprehensible Spanish, swaying and lurching drunkenly, half-heartedly swinging the machete in the direction of the officers. Their circle expanded and contracted as he moved to and fro, a deadly sort of dance macabre. Perhaps it was a measure of the desperation of the waiting patients in this blighted inner city ER where I was working, but none of the waiting room patients left. They had retreated to the walls and corners, watching the drama expectantly. I was admiring the restraint of the police and the inertia of the other patients, but it was obvious that the situation was unstable and one slip could be disastrous. As a clinician and not a cop, I saw the scenario through different eyes and felt compelled to intervene. I approached the sergeant, who I knew well. Without taking his eyes off the patient, he asked me, what do you think, doc? All bleeding stops eventually, I reminded him. Give him a minute or two and some space. Oh, and get some gloves on. The sergeant indicated to his men to move back, and they complied slightly. This seemed to confuse the patient, and he did a slow, lumbering pirouette, checking out the new deployment. Like the dying swan in Swan Lake, the pirouette devolved into a gentle collapse, into a deep unconsciousness from blood loss, and the police moved in to restrain the patient and deliver him to us for resuscitation. The resuscitation was relatively straightforward. He had lost nearly all his blood volume, and so we transfused him with multiple units of blood and repaired his scalp wound with giant thick silk sutures. His skull was fractured by the blow, but his brain was not visible, and no intervention was required for the fracture. No witnesses to the event could be found, and the patient was not forthcoming with any information. Upon discharge, he actually asked for his bloody machete back. The police kept it on the off chance that they ever found out what happened, but they never did. Scalp wounds are quite common, and over the years I've treated many. The scalp is very vascular and bleeds copiously. Small lacerations can look like catastrophes. Pro wrestlers capitalize on this using tiny razor blades to make surreptitious cuts in their own scalps to simulate significant injury. On the other hand, scalp wounds can be life-threatening due to severe blood loss, as in the patient above. The most dramatic examples of this are the scalping wounds we see in the ER occasionally. The mechanism is the same as the scalping practiced by Native Americans and many others before them. A single deep cut to the bone, across the forehead at the hairline, followed by a sharp tug, will dislodge the scalp in its entirety from the skull. The scalping injuries we see are usually not from frontier warfare, but mostly from patients ejected face first through the automobile windshields. The amount of bleeding from these can be unnerving to the uninitiated, and I frequently have to remind the new residents of a central truth of the ER. All bleeding stops eventually. But put a stop to the scalping, always wear your seat belts. <clears throat> so I had to rework that one quite a bit. Uh, my writing coach was back there, my wife, Bernadette, because uh, it was originally a good deal 
more gruesome and bloody than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's sort of a, a central tension uh, in both telling the telling stories of the emergency department. Many of the stories uh, are not really uh, good to be told in, in a general public setting or a family newspaper. Uh, and some of the funniest stories, though, really, are not fit to be told to anybody but other than our docs. <laughs> uh, in any case. Uh, so one last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, and then we'll open it up to some questions, uh, if you have them, uh, is this notion of epiphany. Uh, in, you know, normally storytelling is about conflict and resolution, or a hero quest, when you go after something and have many trials and finally come home. But more and more, in the sort of postmodern era, you don't get such clean stories and, and people aim for epiphany. And epiphany is uh, recognition or insight, uh, really the sudden apprehension of meaning. Uh, and so I'm going to read this one last story, there's many more stories, but this is the last one uh, I've pulled out for our talk tonight. And when you listen to it, listen to the things we've talked about already. Producing a body quickly, dialogue, metaphor, <clears throat> and now finally epiphany. A man, and the title of this is ER Nurses, ER Nurses. A man died in the ER the other day. This is hardly news. It is an everyday event for us. He had pneumonia. Previous generations of physicians called pneumonia the old man's friend. He comes in the quiet hours when older friends have long since ceased to visit, coming to lift the burdens that old age and infirmity bring. Other generations, no less respectfully, called pneumonia the captain, captain among the men of death. The current generation of physicians see pneumonia as a clinical challenge to be fought at every turn, and mostly we are successful with our powerful antibiotics and sophisticated life support systems. The respect is diminished, but not completely gone. My patients stand the gap between the generations. Pneumonia had come for him in his age-old way, in its timely fashion, but we would fight with modern weapons and high-tech solutions. He was 90 years old. <clears throat> Multiple strokes had left him unable to speak, unable to move, and unable to feed himself. His arms had frozen in flexion, fists tightly clenched, chin resolutely tucked down, and he looked like a fighter, forever refusing to surrender. His breath rattled in his chest, the death rattle all seasoned physicians have heard. Time and again, he chased after his breath, faster and faster, only to catch it, and so exhausted, rest without breathing at all. Chain stokes respirations, the resident reported, a perimortem finding, he explained to the medical student, as the patient's labored, rapid respirations began the losing race again. We should intubate him, Dr. Reiser. He is a full code. I wonder if that's what he would really want, I wondered out loud. The patient's eyes flew open, and his startlingly clear blue eyes fixed on mine. He turned his contracted fist upward, thumb foremost, and jammed it at the ceiling. Thumbs up? What did it mean? Opinions were mixed. The nurses who had been working closely with him since he arrived explained that he could indicate yes or no by waggling his fist sideways for no and up and down for yes. But the gesture he made was a different motion altogether, almost a combination of the two. I tested his understanding. Are you in any pain? Waggled no. Are you short of breath? Waggled yes. Interesting. Do you want us to put you on a breathing machine? Thumb jabbed up. Do you want us to put a tube in your throat to help you breathe? Clear eye contact, then the thumb up. We contacted the family in California who had medical power of attorney. They were indecisive, but for now thought do everything, all heroic measures possible. We tried broad spectrum antibiotics, IV fluids, and non invasive methods of ventilatory support, that BiPAP I was talking to you about. <clears throat> From our computers, we ordered it all and more, and at the bedside, the nurses worked with the patient for hours. Finally, we could wait no longer. I told the old man we would need to put in a tube to help him breathe. His eyes seemed alert and unafraid. He gave me a thumb up. We put him to sleep. 
His flex neck presented a problem, and we used a fiber optic video camera to successfully navigate the extreme curves into his airway. Very slick. Placed on a ventilator, he lasted less than five minutes before going into cardiac arrest. We were unable to resuscitate him. I pressed the team to stop the efforts. By custom, the entire team was serving. Anyone have any objections to stopping? The old man's primary nurse spoke up. I think it is too soon. I think we should keep trying. In my 20 years of asking this question, I have never heard anyone ever object. In hushed respect, we resumed our work. Later, after we finally let him go, I found two of his nurses in the locker room with moist eyes, hugging and consoling each other. Sheepishly, one explained to me, we see lots of patients die, but it's different when they come in talking to you. I looked at her quizzically. I know he couldn't really talk, but you know, he was talking to us. And besides, Dr. Reiser, the way I see it, when nothing in this job can make you cry, and it is probably time for you to retire and do something else. ER nurses. So with that, uh, say I'm going to review the ending. I'll open it up uh, to questions or comments. I'm happy to talk about anything you like.
in that medical record from 10 years ago, which is already populated into my chart. You know. Any diaries that find that your electronic medical system is still bad? Yeah, so I find that. <laughs> it, it, it is formulaic, you know, so I guess that's. <clears throat> did, that, did that put you on to this uh, association? Or are you with the Iliad? Or are you already no, there? no, that predates the yeah, epic. Okay. Uh, it was funny though that it came in. And I gave a talk similar to this to our residency group, and I labeled it, you know, epic storytelling. And they all grow and they're just like, oh, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, you're talking incorporated you know, a lot of different elements from a lot of different disciplines and stuff with all these very intensive. I'm curious as to what you think of the education of the medical students and medical students and doctors and how just how, in your opinion of how that can be how to best prepare doctors to you know um, be prepared to prepare that narrative confidence and um, yeah. Well, general chemistry probably is uh, helpful for narrative confidence. <laughs> There's a certain amount of science you need to go into medical school, uh, but an awful lot of the science that you are required to take as a pre-med uh, has no practical value to being a physician. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, organic chemistry helps me read the shampoo bottle. I don't know that from the face. <laughs> But I've never actually used it in clinical care. Uh, if I ran the world, pre-medical students, medical students, uh, would be probably more versed in the humanities. Uh, I think that's important. But I don't run the world, so. <laughs> uh, it's probably not to have to miss it. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your wonderful sense of humor and your story with us also. Is the emergency room still a place where people who live on the edge can find the, the adrenaline rush? And, and if I gave you a formula, you, you were into uh, muscle bars? <laughs> if I gave you three twos, four speeds, and three eighty nine, can you translate that? Yes, I probably could. One more time. Three twos? Three twos, four speed, three eighty nine. Yes, the four speed is obviously a manual transmission, three eighty nine is a cubic inches. Three twos is probably uh, deuces. Deuces. Yeah. Carburetors. GTO. Oh, GTO. Ah. The adrenaline. The adrenaline. Is that still? Is that present in the emergency? It is. It is. Uh, and it's one of the things our residents really love. Uh, it's not something I get as much of it anymore. But over the course of my career, actually, the adrenaline level has gone down quite a bit because we're so much better at it. When I started. The emergency department was chaotic. Nobody knew emergency medicine. It wasn't a really recognized specialty. We didn't have a body of knowledge to deal with the common things that come in all the time. Uh, now we do. And so we rarely find ourselves, everybody rushing around to find a scalpel or, you know, who knows where we left the ventilator kind of thing. <laughs> We're not taken by surprise. Are there any cars members in here? Cars is a struggle and <laughs> <laughs> so CARS uh, is an all-volunteer rescue squad, and they do such a good job, free hospital, that we're rarely surprised uh, unless something happens very close by uh, and very quickly. We get reports from the field, and patients usually stabilize the same time. But yeah, it, you know, you have cases where it's really challenging and exciting. Yes? Again, I want to thank you so much for, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm a law student, so I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, the formulaic recitation. You mentioned that you find yourself in court uh, more often than you would like to. So do you see, detect any language barrier in the way that, for example, the police or attorneys are going to tell the same story you would? So I, I do a fair amount of uh, crossover into law, medical malpractice, and and what I've noticed between attorneys and physicians uh, is it's very challenging to communicate accurately, particularly in an adversarial uh, system <laughs> in the courtroom. So what courts want is yes or no, black and white answers. Did this doctor do a good job or didn't he? Should he have known or shouldn't he? Uh, you know, those kind of things. And the answer usually in medicine is 
it depends. Or it's hard to say. Uh, and that, you know, there's no role for that in uh, our legal system. Somebody, you know, has to prevail. Both parties can't prevail. Uh, you know, and that, that's not exactly how medicine is practiced. It's sort of the best outcome you can get given the set of circumstances that you're faced with. Is that what you're asking? Indeed. What's that? I said indeed. Yeah. Other questions? I wanted to share with you one. Do you have another question? Oh, it was uh, almost a bit. Are there, is there a certain pattern of behavior that you see that uh, causes your emergency room doctor to make bad decisions um, or decline them in making good decisions? Uh, good question. That? So that's been studied, actually, and in my opinion, studied to death uh, how, how physicians err, you know, how we make errors. And there's a laundry list of biases that physicians bring to clinical encounters that cause them to come to the wrong conclusions. Uh, about why the patient's there or what's wrong with the patient. And we did a talk on it in the residency program, uh, and the residents were all psyched because now we had some science that showed us how we make mistakes, so now we can prevent it. And the, number, the list of biases ran to three pages front and back, uh, and it was impossible to walk into a patient's room uh, without carrying you know, two, three, ten biases with you. Uh, there's location bias, there's anchoring bias, you know, somebody suggested the diagnosis to you and you walked in and the eye sees what the mind knows and, and that you anchored on that diagnosis and failed to consider other diagnoses. Location bias is a huge one for us. Uh, so we have an emergency department and we have an urgent care uh, section of our emergency department where minor things go. Uh, and minor things are things like shoulder strains and major things are things like heart attack, you know. And heart attack sometimes can be shoulder pain. Uh, so you walk into the express care area, and the guy's got shoulder pain, and I've had it for three days. You know, here's your ibuprofen, and off you go. And you walk into the chest pain center, which is another area of our emergency department, and the guy said, I've had shoulder pain for three days. And you go, well, we're going to keep you in the hospital, you know, and then give your cardiac care, location wise. So those are ways you make errors. Uh, the way that you counteract a lot of these biases uh, is by being able to listen to the patient's story. Listen. Uh, to what they're really trying to say to you. And uh, hopefully with narrative competence it comes with an increased ability uh, to hear a patient's actual story. It doesn't always work out the way because patients may not be very good storytellers. Uh, and that's the best. Does that ever happen? Uh, uh, the, the number of patients who come in and come the doctors and medicines. Yes, sir. Uh, one question if you don't mind me asking. What is your opinion of the uh, long health care bill? And also specifically the uh, Supreme Court's dealing with it? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and the law students probably answer that with more authority. I, I have an opinion. Uh, I, this, the heart of the law is the mandate, obviously. People must buy insurance. Uh, and I think that's unconstitutional. And from the oral arguments that went down uh, over the past week, uh, it appears that the majority of the Supreme Court is, it holds that view as well, uh, that the mandate is unconstitutional. If the mandate falls, the rest of the law will fall. You can't require insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions uh, if no one has any incentive to buy insurance until they get sick. It will just be too costly. Uh, having said that, and there, there are other times too, having said that, uh, I think everyone should have health insurance. I mean, to some extent, uh, I, that's a, a self-interested position uh, because most of my patients don't have insurance and, and therefore don't pay me. Uh, so you know, I charge you a lot more money uh, to make up for that. If everyone had insurance, uh, it probably wouldn't affect my actual income at all because reimbursement rates would probably go down. But I just think it would be a just thing for our society. We're, mature enough as a society to, you know, provide health care for all our citizens. If we did that, though, if we had health care for everyone on a single payer system, we would have a pot of money at the beginning of the year, and when that money was gone, you couldn't buy anything else for anybody. So you'd have to make a lot of really hard choices about how you're going to spend that money. And the things that are really expensive in our system probably need to go anyway. Uh, Fugile end-of-life care, very, very expensive. 
about half of Medicare spending uh, per patient is spent in the last year of life. That's probably not pretty much than half your lifetime's medical spending. Uh, a huge portion of it is spent in the last month and it's spent in the ICUs. You know, people dying in ICUs. Some people should die in ICUs, but most elderly people shouldn't. That's not, not a good way to use our money and for people to end their lives. Uh, these are predictable events uh, that we can't really change. Uh, so that, that's my opinion. Uh, we'll see in June when the court rules on the constitutionality of the mandate. No more questions. I, I don't mean that you're going to, I don't mean to put you on the spot if you're, if you're not familiar with this, but if you are familiar with um, the healthcare systems of any other countries, is there any other country in particular that you think we should or should not um, model our system after, or, or that has, I guess, um, a better system than we do? Well, yeah, so that's the, that's the problem. We're the boat with the least leaks, probably, in some ways. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to get my health care in Canada uh, or in the U United Kingdom, uh, which are a single payer system. The United Kingdom can be summed up sort of in one anecdote, and that is if you're on the National Health Service in the United Kingdom and you're 65 and you get kidney disease, you do not get dialysis, which means you will die of your kidney disease at age 66. Uh, you can buy it yourself, but the government's not going to pay for it. You can debate whether that's uh, good or bad, but that's sort of a glaring example of what a single payer system, the choices you're going to be forced to make. Uh, I did want one more question from the class that was done. Thank you so much for coming. I really, really enjoyed this talk. Um, I was wondering about um, people's desire to be seen as an individual by their doctor. I think surrounding the healthcare debate, there's been a lot of language, it's really shown how much people want to be seen as, you know, not just another set of statistics and not just another set of numbers. Do you think that there's any tension between using sort of the stock phrases or using the, the commonly used acronyms that sort of makes these charts seem similar? Is there tension between that and the patient's desire to have a personal sorry, relationship with their doctor and to be an individual within the healthcare system? Yes, is the answer. You, you hit on something very important. Uh, and something we do in medicine, unfortunately, not so much the epithets, uh, which you can uh, give fairly accurate description, but the metonymy we use. Uh, where one part represents the whole, the diabetic foot in bed 51, you know, the bleeding ulcer in bed 32. Uh, we tend to reduce patients to their diseases. And again, you're asking about training and for pre-meds, uh, perhaps a little more humanistic training, a little less cold heart science might help. I, I certainly want my doctor to be, uh, you know, technically <laughs> savvy and know some facts. Uh, but I think we're out of time for questions. I did want to share one uh, story with you uh, really quickly uh, about how I became interested uh, in home in the first place. Uh, and when I was in high school, I, was in, I went to an all-boys high school. And you like that? No. <laughs> Only one way. That's what we got. Uh, so when you're an adolescent uh, in high school, that, that's an interesting way to do it. But uh, twice a year, we would have a play with the, uh, our sister school across town, the all-girls Catholic high school. Uh, and so the plays were the most popular thing for people to do. It wasn't because we were very dramatic. Uh, it was just because you know you got to spend a month uh, over at the girls' school rehearsing uh, all the girls. And my senior year in high school, I was in a play uh, called Wiley. And Wiley was uh, a musical. The spring play was always a musical. Uh, and it was about the Odyssey. It was the Odyssey set to music. And, dance and song, and it was a lot of fun, and, but not a natural fit for me. The, the deal was everybody got to be in the spring musical. They'd find a part for it, no matter uh, how uh, theatrically challenged you were, uh, and I was. I tried out for a singing part, uh, which was embarrassing, and didn't get that. Uh, I tried out for a dancing part, uh, and they put me in the chorus line where I couldn't do any damage. Uh, so I was back here with 30 guys, you know, doing this chorus line number, and all the guys were doing this, and I was doing this. Uh, so I was constantly out of beat, so out of time. So they uh, pulled me out of the, uh, the chorus line, and they said, you need some intensive training uh, in dance. And so they assigned me to the choreographer of the show uh, to work with me and teach me how to dance. The choreographer was this 
18 year old Catholic school girl. Uh, she'd come to practice in leotards in the middle of a Rochester winter. Um, it's something you didn't get to see very often. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, 36 years ago this month. I started dating the choreographer. Uh, that's her in the back there. <laughs> My first day. Married 36 years, high school So that's how I became interested in Homer. And, yeah.